December from the NRCS and I had a really good career. I really enjoyed it. Um, she would ask me way back in seventh grade if um, I wanted to um, go out in the great outdoors and dig holes and create soil maps. Um, I would have signed up for it right away. And uh, my career was um, very rewarding and uh, very enjoyable. Um, so let's get on with the talk. I'm going to talk about today a little bit about our agency, the um, USDA NRCS and what we do. And, you know, I'm going to concentrate on soil survey, um, a little bit of history, a little bit of methods. And then um, I guess my forte was urban soil. So I'll mention a little bit about urban soils. A couple of urban soil surveys, one in New York and one in Los Angeles. Um, and then I'll briefly mention Louisiana soils. I never dug a hole in Louisiana. I'll admit it right now. Um, but um, yeah, I'd like to, um, but I've, I've read up a little on it and then I'll show you what I've read. And then I'll talk about web soil survey um, and give you a little demo. Hopefully um, I'll take up all your time. We'll see. So let's talk about um, the Natural Resources Conservation Service. It's an agency within the US Department of Agriculture. Um, some of you probably heard of it. Some of you may not have heard of it. Um, Department of Agriculture was started by Abraham Lincoln around the Civil War. So um, our agency was started, actually, I think it was called the Soil Erosion Service first, and then it was the Soil Conservation Service, and then the Natural Resources Conservation Service. It was started in the 30s after the Dust Bowl. Um, you might have heard of the Dust Bowl uh, out in the Great Plains area. You know, they started farming some land that was probably marginally suited for agriculture. Had some good years, a lot of rainfall. Plowed them one year, wait for the rains, and the rains never came. But the wind came, and there was just horrible erosion. Um, supposedly, you could see the dust clouds in Washington, D.C. Um, and a really good book written about it um, by Timothy Egan called The Worst Hard Time. Uh, won the National Book Award. Uh, so after, you know, the Dust Bowl, the federal government decided, you know, erosion is a national menace and um, our agency was started. And most of the people in our agency are actually soil conservationists. Um, there's a couple of thousand of them, I, I believe. And they help landowners, farmers, ranchers, um, you know, in conservation of soil, water and other natural resources. Okay, but if you're gonna tell somebody how to conserve soil, you should know something about it, right? And our agency, um, our agency is charged with soil survey, among other things. Um, we have a really good website. You know, our motto of the soil scientist for the NRCS is helping people understand soils. And you go to our website, I guarantee you there's more soils information on there than you can stand. Um, and we have about 700, these numbers might be a little out of date, probably about 700 soil scientists in the agency. And, um, you know, they're spread out. We have 12 regional soil survey offices. Um, we have where the real work gets done are at the MLRA soil survey offices. Okay. What's an MLRA? It's a major land resource area. Okay. An area with similar geology, soils, and land use. And there's about 278 of them in the U.S. And we have about 124 soil survey offices covering them. And that's where the people doing the actual soil survey work are. We have a National Soil Survey Center in Lincoln. It's got a lab. It's got our research soil scientists, um, you know, sort of the brains behind the soil survey, I guess. Um, each state has a soil staff, okay? Um, a state soil scientist, an assistant, resource soil scientists. I'll tell you what they do in, in a little bit. And we have... Um, Soil scientists at the national headquarters in DC. Okay. So you can divide our soil scientists into those that work for soil survey. It's called the soil and plant science division, it used to be called the soil survey division. And that's the bulk of our, our soil scientists. And you know, what they work, what they like to work on most of all is the survey related field work. You know, they create the soil maps. There's a database associated with the soil survey they work on. You know, there's lab analysis, some of them work on research, some of them work on maintaining the standards and updating the standards, you know, taxonomy and the standards for soil survey. 
to work on interpretations, okay? Um, talk about interpretations a little bit, but um, in other words, what, what are the soils suitable for, okay? We map them, you know, we describe them, and then we talk about what they're suitable for. We rate them for different uses and stuff. Um, and then some soil scientists are involved in management and administration. Um, some of us would rather not be in that. Uh, and then each of uh, the states have soil staff, Okay, this is where I worked with um, toward the end of my career. And the soil staff, state soil staff, they mostly um, support the conservationists. Um, the conservationists might need soil science assistance with you know, locating suitability for different conservation programs. Um, a, lot of, a lot of them work on wetland identification. They provide the local assistance to soil survey offices. Um, there's not a soil survey office in every MLRA, there's not even one in every state. And the, the, the local soil, state soil staff personnel are local experts, okay? So they can tell the soil survey offices what's up in their area. And then in some states, they provide technical soil assistance to external customers. Um, we did a lot of that in New Jersey and New York, in areas where we didn't have a lot of our traditional customers, you know, the farmers and ranchers. And we would go out and expand the customer base. You know, the USDA used to be the people's department. So now most of the people live in urban areas. So that's how we justified it anyway. So here's some, um, here's some milestones in both natural and soil science. Okay. Um, first of all, I want to mention this guy, Alexander von Humboldt, who was a, was a Prussian German. And um, why am I bringing up von Humboldt? Well, he traveled around the world and um, he was the first one that noticed that, um, you know, a similar climate, you know, either moving in um, latitude or moving in altitude, you, you found similar vegetation. And uh, he visualized the planet as one organism. Okay? He was probably one of the um, founders of this whole ecology um, concept. Okay. And he visited Russia at one point, and um, that's how he's related. I bring him into soil science anyway. There's a really good book about him. Um, you know, he was very well known in his time, but he, he tends to have been forgotten now. A really good book about him by Andrea Wolf called The Invention of Nature. And actually, um, it was one of the 10 best books of the year uh, by according to the New York Times. And then probably most people would point to um, Dokachayev from Russia as the father of soil science, okay? And he started classifying and mapping soils for tax assessment and, um, you know, Russia is a big country. He noticed um, how soils changed geographically. You know, at the time, um, soil science, soil scientists, you know, um, tended to classify soils by the geologic and physiographic factors. But what Dokachayev did was he took this, you know, um, climatic vegetation zones concept from von Humboldt and he incorporated it, okay? And he came up with the five soil forming factors, and he said soil is an independent natural body. Okay, so um, there's a little copy down the bottom there of um, Dokachayev's, what he called it, sketch map of the world. And you can see that, you know, a lot of the soil um, bands of similar soil, soils are running east west across the similar climatic vegetation does across the globe. Okay. A couple of other people I mentioned um, William Smith, this British geologist. And he was, he came up with the first, you know, nationwide geological map for, for, um, for Great Britain. Um, another good book written by Simon Winchester about William Smith called The Map to Change the World. And what I like, I guess why I bring up Smith is that um, he really um, brought geography and geology and stratigraphy into the field. He, you know, he created a field science out of this, out of this and, you know, that had an effect on soil science as well. And another um, British scientist, Jeffrey Milne, who was working in East Africa, he came up with this Katina concept, okay, how, you know, soils change with um, topography, okay, Katina means chain in Latin, and, um, and that's a, a really important part of mapping soils, you know, this idea that the soils change um, <clears throat> with topography, moisture relations change, the erosion uh, effects change as well, okay. And let's go to the um, USDA soil survey, okay? 
Milton Whitney was the first chief of Division of Agricultural Soils, you know, back at the end of the last century. And he started the whole soil, soil surveying efforts in 1899. So we've been doing it more than 100 years. And um, Whitney was, um, he started, um, you know, the methodology for soil survey. You know, let's map small areas at a time and let's, let's establish standard methodology for our survey. And another important person I like to think in soil survey was Curtis Marbot. Um, he had the soil survey division a little later on. Marbot introduced these Russian ideas on soil genesis. And then, you know, there was probably some pushback against that, but, um, you know, the Russian ideas caught on in the US and everywhere else around the world. And I, I like this quote by Marbot, you know, describe the soils as you find them and then worry about, you know, the genesis. And I saw it sort of, believe that's the case when you're describing a soil profile as well you know people might say well what, what horizon is that what horizon is that well let's describe it first and let's look at all the characteristics and then put horizon names to it okay and, and that was that was what Marbit did back then so so what is soil survey um, it's a soil map soil descriptions and properties of the soils on the map and it's ratings and interpretation. Like I said, you know, what are those soils good for? What are they not good for? Um, like I said, the soil survey began in 1899, and really it was to assess agricultural productivity to find more soil suitable for agriculture. But one of the charges of the survey is keep the survey relevant to ever-changing needs. Okay, uh, and once upon a time we we published hard copy soil surveys. And um, I'll show you that there are archived copies of those online. Um, now we go to the web soil survey, but web soil surveys got a lot of good advantages, but there are some things in the hard copy surveys that I'll show you that so far haven't showed up on the web soil survey. And, you know, that may change, but um, we'll talk about that as we go along. So when you do a soil survey, you know, the beginning is to come up with a project plan. And, you know, you figure out, well, who's going to use this? What are they going to use it for? Okay. And what are the important soil properties that we should pay particular attention to? And all soil surveys have a mapping scale. You know, that may be, um, that may be hard to um, comprehend. You know, now we've got GIS and you can zoom in and zoom out and you say, well, what's the mapping scale? Well, at some point you've got to decide, you know, what level of detail are you going to map to? Um, what's the smallest delineation you're going to make? And, and that has an important bearing on how long you're going to take for the survey, okay? And you also um, usually you select a base map for your survey, something you want to draw your soil lines on. So here's an example of a survey we did in New York City. Um, this is for Gateway National Recreation Area. It's not a very big area, 20. 5,000 acres, and the scale we used, it's what we call a very large scale, very detailed, okay, 1 to 4,800. Um, not many surveys go into that much detail. And the reason was the National Park Service, you know, that was managing this National Recreation Area, all their resource inventory was at that scale, okay, all the vegetation and stuff, so they asked us to conduct the survey at that scale, so we did. And, um, it became a very useful tool for them. And so here's a little more about scale. You know, your initial objectives, you establish the scale. And the scale is related to the minimum size delineation. We have different orders of soil survey. Okay, one, two, three, four, five. The order one are the most highly detailed. Okay? And this is what we call the PEDON scale. PEDON is, is a, an individual soil unit, okay. And this would be one to 12,000 or larger, okay, one to 6,000. Um, that extreme one that I showed you was one to 4,800, okay. Um, one to 12,000 would be one inch equals 1,000 feet, all right. The 6,000, one inch equals 500 feet. And generally the, um, the minimum size delineation with one to 12,000 would be about an acre and a half, okay. With one to 6,000, it's probably closer to like a half an acre. 
What are two? Most most soil surveys, I think most of the ones for Louisiana are about one to 24,000 scale, okay? That's what we call a landform scale, okay? And the minimum size delineation for the one to 24,000 is about six acres. Okay. And then these, these um, smaller scales, okay, uh, landscape scale, um, you know, maybe something some of the some of the big areas like Alaska, you know, at one to one million scale, landscape scale, you're talking about a ten thousand acre minimum size donation. Okay. So, so why are soils different? You know, if soils weren't different, we need soil scientists, right? Um, well, you probably learned about the soil forming factors, you know, when these are the same, the soil is the same. You change one, you change the soil. Well, to map soils, we use the soil landscape model. And you can sort of, based on changes in topography and parent material, you can sort of predict and map soils. Okay, this is this is for an area in Pennsylvania with sandstone and colluvial bedrock. And here's a chart that explains that particular block diagram. Okay, so parent material sandstone residuum. Okay, um, the uh, soils are formed um, in weathered parent, weathered sandstone bedrock, okay? So on the steep slopes, you have inceptosols, okay? Not very stable, there's erosion. And, um, so you tend to get an inceptosol, which is not a completely developed, it's sort of an immature soil, right? On the stable surfaces, you have an ulthosol, okay? The higher elevations where it's colder, you get spotosol, spotosols, okay? There's not as much microbial decomposition. You get um, iron oxides, iron moving with um, organic acids in these soils. And then um, on the steep slopes, you have colluvial soils, okay? Which is uh, um, soil material that has moved down the slope, okay? And then different um, soils for different drainage classes. Drainage classes are essentially the landscape positions, okay? On lower landscape positions, um, the wetter soils, okay? Those drainage classes across the top would be excessively drained, well-drained, moderately well-drained, somewhat poorly drained, and then poorly drained. In each of those, you would have a successively higher water table. Water table would be closer to the surface, okay? Okay, so that's... Um, our soil landscape model. And what do we use to map soils? We use three inputs. One is um, we use the remote imagery nowadays. We use aerial photos often as a base map. Okay, and the best way, the traditional way to use these aerial photos is with stereo pairs. I don't know if you looked in a stereoscope, but um, you know, you get these aerial aerial photograph, aerial photographs taken by an airplane and diff two different paths and you put them under the stereoscope and you can see in 3D. You know, what better way to cut out portions of the landscape than seeing it in 3D? I don't think you can do this with a computer yet. Maybe someday you can, but um, and it's getting harder, harder to find aerial photography, but um, it's really the best way to, um, to delineate soils, to map soils. So we use remote imagery, we use spatial data, okay? We use the topographic maps and we use geologic maps, okay? To find out what the parent material is and what the landscape position is. Okay, and then we can create a, a soil landscape model and we need to go out and field check it, okay? We need to field check it with uh, traverses across um, the different um, landforms, we do transects, we do profile description. I'll talk a little bit more about each of these, okay? So we're really cutting out pieces of the landscape when we delineate soils, okay? A valley, a side slope, and a ridge crest. Okay, so we're doing, we're delineating a polygon, which is a landform segment, and essentially it makes up a soil map unit, okay? And the map unit, usually composed of one or more components, okay, depending on the scale. You know, oftentimes there'll be smaller areas, you know, that might have a different parent material or a different um, landscape position, but we're too small to cut out at that scale, okay? And 
for each of the map units, there'll be multiple delineations, okay? It will be a repeating um, map unit across um, the survey area, okay? All right, let's talk about how we, um, the field observations we make, okay? We check or revise the soil landscape model. The first one are these traverses I mentioned, okay? You walk across different delineations, all right? And you want to make sure that you got the landform breaks right, and you walk across these different map units or different delineations, and you look and see, you know, are there any smaller um, inclusions? Are there any smaller areas that um, I didn't delineate that I've got to, you know, be aware of? So, um, then we do transects within the delineations, okay? And you know, there are standards for this, and I think depending on the size of your um, the acres of your map unit, you have to do at least three transects per map unit, okay? Do these transects per map unit, okay? So there's a 10 point transect across that particular map unit. I mean, usually they're in a straight line, you do a, a compass bearing, but this was sort of a, an odd shaped map unit. So just drew the points in there. Um, and, and what this, um, what these transects do, you know, you do three per map unit and you get the percentage of each of the, um, components in that map unit, okay? Maybe it'll be 90% of your, your, your main um, component and 20% of these little inclusions of other types of salons, okay? And the other type of field observations, you gotta do your detailed profile descriptions, okay? And usually you do three of these per component. Components are usually soil series. I'll talk about what soil series is. And you do these detailed descriptions. You wanna find the range and characteristics, okay? What, Type of horizons do I have? How thick are they? What color are they? And stuff. And and you want to fit you want to fit the best soil series or whatever taxonomic unit you're you're, you're using for that component. You want, you want to make it select the best one. This was a serpentinite till soil in in Staten Island in New York City, and um, you know we did our profile descriptions and there was no soil series that fit them. So we ended up creating our own soil series for this. In New York, okay, And that's what you gotta do sometimes. So when we do our, how are soils different? When we do our soil descriptions, these are some of the things that we describe. We describe the horizons, we describe for each horizon, the color, the texture or the particle size distribution. There's our, our color chart on the top and there's our textual triangle below. We describe the structure, okay? Um, what, what size and what shape of aggregates um, are the sand, silt, and clay aggregated into, okay? We describe the consistence of those aggregates. How firm are they? Because that can have an important effect on water and root growth in the soil, water movement and root growth. We usually do a pH of the different horizons and we assess um, the wetness by looking at the depth of water table, okay? Um, and we assign, you know, drainage classes based on the depth of water table. Um, we usually I do our descriptions to at least 100 centimeters, one meter, we try and get them to two meters, okay? Um, these are the different um, drainage classes that we use in New York and New Jersey. They're different in Louisiana, but um, these are depth of water table and associated drainage classes, okay? So accessibly drained. You wouldn't have a water table within 72 inches and it would be coarse textured to boot, okay? Same with a somewhat accessibly drained, that would be coarse textured, no water table within 60 inches well drained 40 to 60 inches. Okay, and then you start getting the water table within the profile. So not only well drained, somewhat poorly drained. Poorly drained, it's within six inches and then very poorly drained, it's actually ponded, okay, above the soil surface. And how do we assess this? Well, we use our color book and we look at the depth to, we call low chroma or gray redox features in the soil profile, okay, um, when the soil it's saturated with water, it turns anaerobic, iron becomes soluble. Iron usually gives soils that brown or red color. When the iron is soluble as removed, you get a gray color, okay? So we use our color chart and this low chroma stuff 
These are all these colors on the left-hand side of your color chart. And that's the low chroma, chroma of one or two. Okay. So that's essentially how you would assess soil wetness. You're looking at the depth of seasonal high water table. Like I said, this this is how we assign the drainage classes in New York, New Jersey. It's it's different for different regions and different states. So it's probably different in uh, Louisiana. Okay. Soil series, most common map unit component. In the soils in series. Series is the lowest, um, most specific unit of our soil taxonomy, right? Order, suborder, great group, subgroup, uh, family, series. Um, Soils in series of the same parent material, you know, formed under the same climate vegetation, um, same horizons, same drainage class, same particle size class. And usually they're named after a geographic origin, okay? Um, Louisiana, there's 315 soil series mapped, okay? And here's, here's a Deerfield soil that we mapped in, in New York and Staten Island. Deerfield is actually named after um, Deerfield, Massachusetts, but it fit our soils in in Staten Island, and this is moderately well drained. Okay, the seasonal high water table is at 60 centimeters. Can you see the gray colors down there? Okay, that's where we said the seasonal high water table was. Okay, and those gray colors meet that chroma too. Okay, um, so map units components, like I said, most commonly they're soil series, but they could be a higher level of classification. Why would you want to do that? Well, Sometimes the range in characteristics is just too great to squeeze into a soil series and you have to use something higher. An example is a great group, UD Fluvent Salome, okay, one of your, um, actually your soil survey for um, Lafayette Parish uses UD Fluvent Salome. And those are recent alluvial um, river deposited soils and they probably just were too variable to fit into a soil series. And, and other types of map unit components are miscellaneous areas, okay, those non-soil areas. Um, the most common one we use in the Northeast is this urban land, okay, which is the paved or impervious surfaces, okay. Um, we differentiate those, okay. Um, other miscellaneous areas include beaches, uh, rock outcrop. There's one called the oily wasteland and in water is a miscellaneous area too. Okay, so these are types of components that make up map units. And you could have a consociation, which is a map unit made of a single component. Okay, there's an example. Map unit symbol is MBA. The map unit name is Memphis Silt Loam, zero to one percent slopes. Okay, you notice that there's a, a slope class associated with most of our map units. Okay, slope class has an important effect on land use and readings. <clears throat> You can have consociations, okay, single component, or you can have complexes, okay. When you've got two or more components, usually they make up more than half of the um, map unit composition, and you are unable to separate them at the mapping scale, okay. Here's an example, and this was used in Lafayette Parish, a Moata frost complex, okay. Um, two soils, they actually have the same drainage class. I think they're both poorly drained. Difference is one is fine and one is fine silty. So the fine one has got a lot more clay than the fine silty. And these were things that, you know, you could not, you really couldn't see by looking at a um, an aerial photograph. Really. Okay. So consociations, complexes, different types of mappings. Okay, I put the textual triangle in there to show you. The frost to find silty would be mostly silt loam and silty clay loam, whereas the water of the fine would be more of your silty clay loam and silty clay. Okay, that's 35 to 60 percent clay. You're getting up there in clay content. Okay. You do have a soil survey database where you stick all the data associated with the soil survey. Okay. A server is in Kansas City, and you can go in there and you can download certain parts of the database and edit. You check it out, you edit it and check it back in again, okay, when you're updating a soil survey. Okay, and what's, you know, I mentioned there's some advantages about web soil survey. One of the advantages is that it's it's um, updated every year. The data refresh is done each year. So if there's something you wanna change, um, you can go in there and you can change that um, year after year. If there was land use changes, you wanted to change something. 
Um, if you've got better information about a, a particular soil, um, maybe you did some lab sampling, you found more about the physical, chemical, or mineralogical characteristics of the, of the soil, you could go in there every year. Whereas, you know, with a hard copy survey, you couldn't really do that. Um, we have field reviews, quality control for soil surveys. Okay, when you're um, um, working on an initial soil survey or updating the soil survey, every year you would have quality control field review, okay, where you'd get the regional soil scientist who was the expert, the regional expert would come in and he would want to see every soil you're mapping, okay, and he'd want to say, okay, I want to see your Deerfield soil, or I want to see your Moata soil, or I want to see your Frost soil. And you would show him an area that you had selected where you had a typical pet on of that particular soil series, okay? And he would look at it and he would make sure that that fit, you know, the ranging characteristics for that soil series. Okay, and you could also get, you would invite people from nearby um, soil survey areas, you know, who are probably familiar with the soil, soil as well. And, and um, you know, it was, it, was, it was always a good time. and. Um, was for a good purpose as well. Um, one of the most enjoyable parts of um, conducting a survey is a lab sampling, okay? Um, <clears throat> we try and lab sample all of our soils so we have pretty accurate, you know, physical, chemical, mineralogical properties to put in a database, okay? And um, so you would dig a nice soil pit to at least two meters. You would get people from, you know, the surrounding areas that come and help you and you would um, send all your soil samples off to the, the um, soil survey lab in Lincoln. And, um, always have a good time. It's always good to get out of the office and get away from the computer. And, okay, so now I'm going to shift to urban soils. Talk a little about urban soils, okay. Um, there's similarity in urban soils um, globally, but I like the way um, Professor Charzynski from Poland put it, the urban soil pattern is unique for every city. Um, it's a good introductory book for urban soils and it's pretty um, reasonably priced. Um, edited by Maxine Levin, who used to work for the NRCS, also retired. Um, so the, the pattern, soil pattern for every city is unique because of the geography and geology, right? Because of the land use history and disturbance and because of management practices, um, and things like um, uh, liming and fertilization, uh, <clears throat> different land use management practices. Uh, and here's a picture of one of our earlier soil surveys. There's Ed White and Horace Smith. Um, Horace is decked out in his plant bell bottoms there, and uh, they were working on the Soil Survey of District of Columbia, which was um, released at our nation's bicentennial in 1976, it was a really good uh, landmark urban soil survey. And Ed went on to become the State Soil Science of Pennsylvania. Horace went on to become the director of the Soil Survey Division. So um, both had really good careers. So when we're conducting an urban soil survey, what are we? How are we slicing up the pie? What are we? What are we slicing? What are we differentiating? Okay. So what we're looking at is we want to separate out the, the native soils from the human altered or human disturbed soils, okay? And what are the native soils? Well, these are the soils that, you know, are either formed from bedrock or residuum. They're soils that are formed in what we call naturally deposited materials, okay? In New York City, we had soils um, formed in materials deposited by the glacier, okay? Or there could be um, soils formed in um, alluvial sediments or wind deposited sediments, okay? And we want to separate those from the soils that have been disturbed by humans, okay? Um, and we've got these two terms we came up with. One is human altered soils. And those are soils that have been mixed or disturbed to humans um, to a depth greater than 50 centimeters. An example is this um, cemetery soil here, okay? And that has been dug up, okay, all the horizons disturbed, and then backfilled, thrown back into the hole, okay? So you lost all that internal organization, lost the horizonation, um, 
So water's not going to move through that as rapidly. Um, you don't have the distinctive um, physical and chemical properties of each of the horizons that you used to have. So that's a human altered soil. Okay, and then there's human transported soils, and those are what we think of as fill soils. Okay, when you move material from outside of that pet on and put it on top of your existing pet on, <clears throat> and that's also got to be more than 50 centimeters thick. And we found that um, it pays to separate soils if they've got a lot of artifacts in them. Okay, what are artifacts? Things like uh, glass, wood, concrete, brick, asphalt. Well, they actually, it turns out they have a important effect on the physical and chemical properties of the soil. Um, concrete has a um, really um, distinctive effect on liming the soil. Okay, we've our New York City soils are naturally pH is around uh, four and a half to five and a half. You throw concrete chunks in there, and over time you get pHs up around eight and a half. Okay, and we separate out the different types of fill. Okay, the clean fill, which has got little or no artifacts, the construction debris, which is loaded with artifacts, the dredge fill from dredge sediments. Um, the soils in municipal solid waste landfills. And there are actually areas that are predominantly um, coal ash soils, okay, where coal ashes was used to um, fill in wetlands or um, just uh, big coal ash mounds. Um, coal ash was, coal was used um, for heating and okay, power generation um, way back when. And we also separate out these miscellaneous areas, okay, these non soil areas. Uh, the, the urban land, um, the paved over areas are what we call sealed soils, and other non soil areas, the beaches, rock outcrop. Okay, so this is what we try and, and separate in um, urban areas. Um, one of the things we was very useful to us in um, mapping soils in New York City was, was some of these older maps, okay. We use this USGS map from 1902, and this had a superficial geology sheet, and that told us what things were like back in 1902. You compare the um, um, current aerial photograph with that, and you could see that what areas, obviously see what areas were filled, okay? Um, you've got some swamp muck there and some dune sand, and that's not there anymore, so pretty much get a pretty good handle on what areas have been filled and um, that was very helpful. Okay, in Los Angeles, um, you know, we like the, the geologic map. In Los Angeles, they found that the DEMs, the digital elevation models were very helpful in mapping anthropogenic landforms. Um, okay, if you look closely on that DEM to the right, uh, you can see the terracing, okay? Um, there was a lot of um, um, very steep slopes there. Um, they wanted to put develop those areas, put housing in it. So they did a lot of terracing, and um, the DEMs were really helpful for them in finding the degree and extent of hill slope terracing. Okay. So use what tools you you know you can in um, really assessing the. Um, anthropogenic types of anthropogenic disturbance in an area. So let's talk about um, New York City and its um, geography, geology, and history of um, land use and development. Okay, New York City was um, settled by the Europeans and um, it's really a, an open society and a very productive natural environment. Um, the problem with New York City was there was really limited room for expansion, okay? You've got a couple of islands and a, a peninsula. There was a lot of wetlands. There was an extensive coastal zone and the Dutch were really good at filling wetlands. The English were really good at expanding the shoreline. And usually they used, you know, waste materials to do that, okay? Construction debris, dredge spoils. And that really had a big effect on the soils in New York City, okay? Um, limited area to expand, a lot of wetlands, a lot of waste materials, put it all together. So here's our totals for New York City. 63% um, of the city is paved over, okay, of the land area. 
And there's a lot more of these fill soils than there are native soils, okay? Um, looks like about three times as many. As much of the area in native soils in these human altered and human transported soils, okay? And you could see in these um, human altered, human transported soils, most of them are the spoliac, the clean fill, but there's a lot of them that have artifacts in them. Some of them are dredged, and so there's a good mix of those. Okay, um, so only nine percent of the um, native soils remaining, and there's one of the soils on the left um, formed in the construction debris. Okay. Um, let's look at Los Angeles. Okay. Um, <clears throat> You know, the development was um, pretty much after that of New York City, and they had plenty of room to expand, okay? What was a bigger problem in Los Angeles or, you know, a bigger cause of disturbance was that, you know, there were these mountain ranges and hill systems, so there's a lot more land leveling and this hill slope terracing than there was filling, okay? So a lot of what we call constructional and destructional landforms. Okay? So rather than the filling, altered the topography. And here's the, um, the citywide totals for um, LA according to their survey. So that's got a less impervious cover. Okay, they've got only 11% of these human altered, human transported soils. And most of the disturbance is this you know, less than 50 centimeter surface amended soils, okay? 12% um, native soils, okay? So a lot more in the way of um, um, terracing, okay, cut and fill, surface amending, then there is filling. And um, the fills, the soils that were filled, there's, there are all this clean fill. So didn't really have that issue with, um, you know, all this construction debris and, and uh, waste disposal in their fill. So if you were to look at, compare the two cities and look at the soil forming factors affected by human disturbance, okay? Um, in New York City, I would say that um, the paramaterial was altered quite a bit, all right? We've got a lot more soils in this um, human transported material, okay? Um, and we lost a lot of the wetlands. We've altered a lot of the chemical, physical, biological, and mineralogical properties in these uh, human altered soils, okay? A lot of them, um, because of all the concrete, um, there's uh, drastic changes in pHs, there's elevated levels of nutrients and trace metals as well. We've also added um, black carbon, a lot of this waste carbon, um, soot, um, asphalt, uh, and we've added quite a bit of calcium carbonate from that um, from that concrete. Whereas Los Angeles, we probably changed um, the soil forming factors. We probably changed the relief factor the most rather than the parent material. Okay, mass grading, um, resurfacing. We've also done a little bit of landscape management, um, irrigation. Okay, so they've altered the topography altered the physical property somewhat, okay? And uh, here's one of the soil profiles. They call it the graded surface phase. So I think the top 40 centimeters of that were graded, okay? So, okay, so let's go to Louisiana. Um, sort of like this old um, soil areas map from uh, Lytle back in 68. I don't know if you're familiar with this. I, I sent a copy of this to your instructor. But there are you know, six or seven um, general areas. There's a coastal plain in yellow. Okay, mostly on the north. Okay, um, soils formed in coastal plain deposits. There's these Lost Hills and older Mississippi River terraces, um, which is actually most of um, Lafayette Parish. Okay, that, um, I don't know what you want to call it, um, sort of a darker red color here in the central portion. There's the flatwoods on the east and west, okay. Um, coastal prairies over here in the southwest. Recent alluvium from the Mississippi and 
a few other rivers. And then down the south, there's the coastal marshlands, okay? And they each have, you know, their own <clears throat> different types of parent material, um, their different soil orders and different land uses, essentially, okay? Coastal plain, um, some of the older parent materials. So you've got some alphasols and alphasols, most of that in woodland. Coastal prairie in the southwest, um, Paleon, windblown and alluvial uh, river deposits over the Pleistocene sediments. You've got some mollusols out there, alphasols, mollusols, and vertisols. And that's mostly pasture, okay, which fits the mollusols. Coastal marsh in the south, okay, um, alluvial and marine sediments. You've got some anthosols and histosols down there. Most of that is wildlife habitat. Flatwoods in the southeast and southwest. Um, most of that is woodland. Um, the Bus Hills and Mississippi Terraces, which is where you are, um, you've got a good variety of soils there. Woodland, cropland, and pasture. And the recent alluvium, alluvial sediments. Um, we've got alpha soils, septosols, and the more recent entosol. Okay. Um, I mentioned MLRAs. There are 11 of those in um, Louisiana. Okay, so they they slice up the pie a little finer than those um, areas from that um, Lytle publication. Okay, but they're similar and they're similar to the geology. Okay, um, you know they've got an East Gulf Coast flatwoods and a West Gulf Coast flatwoods. Divide the alluvium up a little more, and they have a southern and western coastal plain. But essentially, they agree with them. And here's your state soil with your state soil scientists and your assistant state soil scientists. Okay, the Rustin. Um, there's all the information you need to know about that. And that's got a really distinctive orange color. Okay, that's a pale udult. Pale udult. What does that mean? Well, the ultrasols are among the most weather and a paleudult. It's got a really thick argillic horizon, okay? The argillic horizon is that zone of translocated clay that you get in the older soils. And a paleudult means it's got a really thick argillic, which means it's really old, okay? So um, that's the rust in your state soil. Uh, and I also have a picture of this, um, so the, rust, the rustin is formed in um, the marine or stream deposits, okay? And it's sort of loamy, okay? And that means it's, um, you know, it's probably got loam or um, sandy loam or fine sandy loam textures. I also have a picture of the fluker, okay? That's a fine silty soil. That's formed in lust, okay? The lust tends to have silty texture, right? Silt is the most erodible of the um, particle size classes, right? So your um, your less deposits, um, windblown deposits tend to be high in silt, maybe very fine sand as well, okay? So this is fine silty. Fluker, it's a fragile, glossudolf, okay? What does that mean? Well, it's got a glossic horizon. A glossic horizon is it's EB here, okay? It's a combination of a Alluvial horizon and a B horizon. Alluvial is one where material is being washed out of, okay, alluvial. And B is the alluvial where the material is being deposited into, okay. And glossic means that there's this sort of tonguing of the E alluvial into the alluvial, the B. So in here you can sort of see a little bit of tonguing in that E horizon, okay. So that's the glossic. And the fragi is a fragipan. There's a really nice description of fragipans in that light of publication. A fragipan is a dense water and root restrictive layer, okay, pedogenically formed. That's the BTX, okay. Um, this is fine silty, so you probably would have um, silt loam and maybe um, silty clay loam textures in this, okay. Okay, so those are your um, two Louisiana soils. Um, you're lucky you have two old soil surveys in Lafayette Parish to look back on, you know, for historical and other reasons. Um, one back in 1916 and one back in 1977. And um, I compared 
both of them, you know, this was the first generation of salt surveys, 1916. It's a very small scale. Okay, one to 62,360, one inch equals a mile. Okay, and there's one. So with these old surveys, um, the minimum size donation is 40 acres. So, I mean, if you had a, a farm smaller than that, you know, sort of got lost in, in a big map. map. They didn't cut out any slope classes back then, there were only 10 series. The series were broader way back then. We started to divide them up a lot more finer, for better or for worse. Um, and they're only 12 map units. Okay, in the 77 survey, we're at 1 to 24,000 scale, so 1 inch equals 2,000 feet. There are 27 field sheets, minimum size delineation, uh, much smaller, six acres, four slope classes, 15 series, 26 map units. Okay. And we'll look at those. And this is, um, uh, um, you know, most all surveys have this um, chart that shows you um, parent material and, and the topography, sort of the drainage class, okay. And the Lafayette um, survey of 77 has it. And I really like these. They don't have these charts in, um, in web soil survey. And it gives you an overview of all the soils in the county and their parent material and their drainage class. So I like to, you know, the first thing when I look at a soil survey is I like to go to this chart. So this is taken from the chart. I'll show you what it, what the real chart looks like when we um, go to web soil survey. But these are the different soils mapped in your parish. So um, these are just the lost soils, okay? Um, and I put up, I updated it with the classification, okay? There's the topography, there's the drainage class, okay? See, there's only one well drained, and then there's a lot of there's four somewhat poorly drained and one poorly drained. There's a depth of seasonal high water table, and there's the duration of the seasonal high water table. Okay, um, seems like with the somewhat poorly drained, there may be some overlap, but um, they're different classification. Okay, some of them are alpha sols, one of them is a mollusol, okay, and some of them are um, epi aquals which means that there's um, a perched water table versus a, is there a, okay. Yeah, one's a, an aqualum, okay. And one's got calcium carbonate concretion. So there are little minor differences between those. Here's the, um, there's soils in Lafayette Parish formed in Mississippi River alluvium. And some of them are formed in Red River alluvium, okay. And there are soils formed in um, prairie formation sediments, okay? Uh, this is where you didn't have, you know, uh, either windblown deposits or um, alluvial deposits over really the, the bedrock, the sediment that serves as the bedrock in prairie formation, okay? And some of these are, um, tend to be pretty high in clay expanding clay at that. Okay, so here's just a review of the soil waters mapped in the state and Lafayette Parish. So in the state, you've got um, a good variety of soils mapped. Lafayette Parish, not too bad as well. Okay, so web soil survey, there are a couple things you can do in web soil survey. Um, you know, if you're interested in um, a soil map for a particular area, you can go in and get a get you make yourself a little um, PDF custom report for your area of interest. Okay, you go in there and you select an area of interest, either draw it in or you can in, you can um, import a shape file if you want, and then get the soil map for that area, and then go in and pick interpretations for that or ratings for different uses. If you're interested in working with GIS, you can go in and download the spatial data, the shape files, and some of the tabular data associated with it. And that's done by county or by borough. And if you want to look at those old um, soil surveys, they're archived in there as PDFs, and you can do that as well. Okay. And we'll we'll go through that. So here are the map unit descriptions, okay, in web soil survey. So you go to a you know, you get your soil map and you want to find out about um, a particular map unit, okay? We'll tell you what the composition is, um, 
what the setting is, okay, what's the land for and what's the parent material, okay, um, land form position. And it'll give you a nice typical profile, okay. Um, so you can see this Memphis silt loam, okay. Uh, and there's the typical profile. I put the textual triangle in there. Somebody, um, <clears throat> In uh, when you're looking at the interpretations or the soil properties and qualities in web soil survey, these are a few of the things you can look at. You can look at the chemical properties, okay, something like pH. You can look at how erodible the soil material is in each horizon. Look at the physical properties, the textures. There's soil qualities and features, uh, different ratings. Water features, which gives you um, deficits on high water table. Um, and uh, I wanted to show you what um, one of these um, histosols um, looks like, which um, are probably pretty common in the coastal marsh area of Louisiana. This is an organic soil from the Meadowlands. I think the only difference is a lot of ours probably have a greater salt water effect and you get sulfitic materials in ours, which tend to be problematic in some ways. Okay, you can also look at in web soil survey the suitabilities and limitations for all these different uses. Okay, uh, building site development. Maybe we'll take a look at that in web soil survey. Um, there are land classifications. You look, look at whether or not it's prime farmland. Um, sanitary facilities will get um, um, suitability for septic systems and so on and so forth. And I put a picture in here of a spodosol. Um, I don't know if you have any in Louisiana. Um, there, none of them are mapped there, but you, you might have some. There are some of these in Florida as well, but um, these are the ones with the really big albic horizons. Um, albic where the, the iron has been leached out of there and the iron is washed out of the albic and is deposited down here. It gets this chocolate brown color. So iron and organic matter moved down here and deposited down here. But you might have some of these in your Flatwoods area on the east, um, uh, you know, probably a minor massive. Okay, so in addition to web soil survey, um, you may or may not know, but there is a app for your cell phone um, put together by um, UC Davis, California Soil Resource Lab, where you can get soil mapping on your cell phone um, for the soil beneath your feet and what could be better to impress your friends than to show them what the um, on-site soil information is. So <clears throat> there are a lot of TECO references we use for soil survey and they're all available online. Um, the manual, uh, which is a good, uh, good um, discussion of soil survey methods. The handbook, which is much more technical, gives you all the um, standards and criteria. To, um, Probably the best one, um, most useful was this field book for describing and sampling soils. And um, you can get a digital copy online. You can also, um, they'll, I think each person can get one um, hard copy and it's really nice, comes in a um, plastic coated pages. Um, you can get a copy of that for yourself. So if you're doing any soil description, it's really good to have that field book. And if you wanna do your own classification, um, Keys to Soil Taxonomy. And, uh, <clears throat> I'll point out in the 12th edition, we've got on the cover human altered soils, uh, including one from New York City. Um, our soils, our agency also has, um, I talked about, we like to keep the survey relevant to ever changing needs. We have focus teams, okay. And the focus teams concentrate on um, different soil survey issues. There's a coastal zone team, okay. It's probably a lot of soil scientists in Louisiana active in the coastal zone team. Um, they concentrate on coastal soils. Um, there's a big effort in the agency right now on uh, blue carbon, okay? Um, measuring blue carbon stocks, um, how much carbon is sequestered in these tidal marsh soils, okay? And uh, mapping subaqueous soils, okay? Um, soils in shallow water. Um, there's an urban soils focus team. I used to be the co-chair of that, and it's still very active. Randy Rill from LA is the co-chair of the digital soil mapping team. 
Um, there's a bunch of other um, focus teams. Um, you can check them out on the website. Um, and these were a few um, words of encouragement uh, from David Rossiter at Cornell. Okay. And uh, what's most exciting about soil science? Well, it's the opportunity of making reliable predictions of soil functions over the landscape, all based on a tiny fraction of direct observations and a large dose of inference. Okay. So it's an intellectual challenge. And um, I know I really liked getting out in the field and away from the computer. Okay, okay so um, thanks. We're gonna go and look at Web Soul Survey. There's my email address. If anybody has any questions or anything, I'd be glad to. Now that I'm retired, I have plenty of time, so. Um... Okay, good? Yes, we can see the soul survey, good. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you can just Google Web Soul Survey and um, that should take you here. Let me make sure I'm not running out of juice on my phone. Yeah, I'm good. All right, so first thing we're gonna do, let's look at the archive survey, okay? Like 20 minutes. Get you off early. Um, ready? Can you see where I am? I'm going over to the archive soil surveys before we start web soil survey. Let's can you click guys on archive. Come up. Everybody can, see it? We can see. Okay. And then let's go to Louisiana. And let's go to. Lafayette. Okay, and you got two choices here, 1916 and 1977, and current. You got three choices. Current would take you to the Web Soil Survey. So let's look quickly at 1916, and you can see it says manuscript. Let's take a look at it. Okay, here it is, 1915 published in 1916. So um, here's what it's got, okay? There are your um, soil types, all right? There's a description of the area, climate, agriculture, soils, little descriptions of each of the soils, all right? Um, some climate information there. So you could go in and see how much that's changed since uh, 100 years. Okay, and then there's little descriptions of each of the soils. All right, here's the um, common silt loam. It's a brown mellow silt loam. Okay, you gotta love the terminology back then. Okay, let's look at the soil map. Okay, and remember I said it was one sheet. Come on now, there it is, one sheet. It's one inch to the mile. So um, let's look at 100% of it. Okay, there it is at 100%. All right, and you can see um, there's a different, there's your, your soil legend on the side here, okay. And you can see your different, um, Areas of different soils, different colors, and you've got the drainage ditches on there, right? Let's go over to the legend over here. And you can see on the left there, um, you know, some, some of the other symbology in the legends, you know. But um, one inch equals a mile. So the smallest delineation on here is about 40 acres, okay? So let's go back. Let's look at the um, 1977 one, okay. Let's
look at what's in there. Okay. So you've got descriptions of each of the series. All right. Let's look at one of these real quick. I'm going to show you what they've got. Okay. There's the AC series. AC. And you get a nice detailed profile description. Okay. In the ranging characteristics, you don't really get that in web soil survey. All right. Um, let's go back. You get that description of the series. You also get a description of the of the map unit as well. Um, okay, there's descriptions of each of the map units as well. Um, okay. The first was the component. And then, and then you get all these tables, okay? Um, there's the acreage and proportional extent of each of the series. Um, there's um, the classification in a table. Um, and here's the table that, that I mentioned that I really like. Um, okay, let's make this a little smaller. Like I said, this, you don't get this in, um, in web soil survey. And I think this is a really good way to see, you know, all the soils in your survey area and their parent material. Okay. And then let's go to the maps. I'll show you how the maps are different than these old ones. Um, there's an index to the map sheets, okay? So that's your whole county and these are the individual map sheets. So let's click on one and we'll look at it. Okay, and, and there you go. And these are, I think one to 28 is, are the different soil types. So here's soil 13, there's 23. And, um, and then this has got an aerial photograph for a base map. And the scale is one to 24,000. So the smallest delineation, I think is about six acres or so, okay? All right, so that was, that was the, um, the two surveys. Okay. So let's go back and look at, let's go into the modern day. Let's go to web soil survey. Okay. Starting web soil survey. All right. Before we pick an area of interest, let's say you're working with GIS and you just want to download the soils data. So you go to this tab here. Okay. And what you want is the Sergo Soil Survey Geographic Area. And you put in your state. County. And all you would have to do is click on this and you get a zip file of um, shape files for Lafayette Parish and some of the tabular data associated with it. Okay, and you can download. All right, so that's how you download the soils data. Let's go back and let's pick an area of interest. Okay, let's, let's create a, a little um, soil report for a certain area of interest. So we'll go into state and county. Like I said, you can put in an address. You can put in, um, if you have a shape file, never actually done it, but they say you can. Let's go in there. And, do... and you would be collecting this uh, shape file for GIS? Yeah, that's right. Say okay. you had an area, an area delineated and you just wanted wanted to know say specifically i want to know what percentage of this is is what you know so so okay. that would be the advantage of, of putting in something accurate like a shape file like that yep okay so one of the first things i like to do is see being a soil scientist and you know i just lectured you 
probably ad nauseum on scale, I like to go in here and set the scale, okay? So you click on this, and what you got to do is hold your ruler up to the screen and adjust this, oops, adjust this to one inch. And I did this before, I happen to know it's 111. Oh, you say, okay, and this starts giving you a scale, okay? So I know it's one to 300. 2000 and I know that all the surveys in this area are 1 to 24 so I'm zoomed way out you know so to zoom in you use this zoom in over here there's a zoom out there's a pan and then these buttons you use to draw in your area of interest okay so let's just zoom in a little closer um, a little closer Okay, and then one to one, one to 51,000, let's get a little bit closer. Okay, I mean, let's, let's just pick an area of farmland here. Let's see that. Okay, that's not bad. Okay, so I'm just gonna make it simple. I'm just gonna draw a little polygon here and this is our area of interest, okay. Okay, see it's all shaded in. There it is. So the first thing you do, let's go up here and get a soil map. Okay, and then here's the soils for that soil map and it gives you the percentage of each, okay. So it looks like um, the bulk of this area is this Bill Crowley complex, okay? So let's say you wanted to know what, what's, what's the story behind this map unit. So you could just click on it and you would get that, remember that map unit description I showed you, okay? So it's 60% Batuville, 25% Crowley. Uh, here's a landform, meander scrolls. You know, the meander scroll is it's sort of a um, little landform associated with the with um, a, a, a river or a stream um, crescent shape usually. And the talf land form position is the talf. Well, usually in flatter landscapes, there's a rise, a dip, and a talf. Okay, you know what a rise is, and you know what a dip is. Talf is the flatter stuff in between. That neither rises nor dips. Okay. And then there's a typical profile for each. So on. Okay. So um, that's the soil map. Um, let's get to the good stuff. Let's say, let's go to the soil data explorer. All right. First, let's look at some suitabilities and limitations for use. Okay, let's look at, let's say um, we wanna know how much of this is prime farmland, okay? So let's go the land classifications. Let's go under farmland classification, okay? And you can either view the description or view the rating. Okay, if you wanna know what does that mean, it's gonna tell me farmland classification. This tells you what that farmland classification is all about, so. Identifies unit as prime farmland. Farmland of statewide importance, local importance, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Okay, so that tells you what it is. Let's get the rating, view the rating. Okay. So it gives you a nice color coded map telling you what the farmland classification is. Okay. And to see what the legend is. You know what's green, what's red. You can either go up here to this legend, click on that, it'll tell you. Okay, so the red stuff is not prime farmland. It's not any other kind of rated prime farmland, but the green is prime farmland. Okay, and also if you if you scroll down, it will tell you. Okay, in a little more detail. You can see the frost, for instance, it's not prime farmland, but the next best stuff is this farmland of statewide importance, okay? All right, so we got that. What we wanna do 
I think it is. Is um, and I can't seem to get rid of this. Here we go. Let's add it to the shopping cart. Okay. Okay, so we added this report on, um, we added this interpretation on land classification of shopping cart, okay. So let's go back and um, can't like, let's, let's look at this old property. I mean, we could look at any, any of these other ones. Um, let's look at building site development. Let's look at, can we put a building with a basement? Um, I have a, Feeling that there's not a whole lot of houses with basements in Louisiana. <laughs> but let's look at um, let's look at the rating. And what color do you think it's going to be? Boom! There you go. Okay. And um, let's scroll down and see why. Okay, and the main reason, okay, some of them it's flooding, but mostly it's the depth uh, saturated zone, depth of work thing. Okay. So most of them are probably, um, what's the term they use? Uh, very limited, okay, very limited. So let's add that to the shopping cart. Okay. And one more thing, let's look at um, sole properties and quality. Let's look at the depth of work table on the areas, okay? Yeah, you say it's saturated. Is that because the water table is too high? Yes, that's right. Okay. Yep. And remember in that chart that I showed you, it, it listed the depth to seasonal high water table, okay? Highest the water table gets during the year. And then it's further listed on the far right what months of the year the water table was up that high, okay? So that's, that's really good information that that, that should, survey would provide. And that's going to be your winter months, like January, February? That's right. The non-off season, okay? Because during the growing season, the plants are sucking up a lot of the water. That's right. Okay. Um, so depth of water table, let's view the rating. And there you go. And then there's the depth of water table. And um, 0 0.25, this is in centimeters. Um, the agency is always trying to go metric. Most of us need a translation though. Um, there's some, I don't know if there's any 25, 50. Most of them look like they're 50 to 100. Yeah. Okay. okay, let's add that to the shopping cart. And then let's get our shopping cart. Let's check it out. Let's get it now. Pretty quick, and you know, if you're a soil consultant, you've got customers that don't know anything about web soil survey. It's how you make your your big bucks, right? You charge them for your own. Um... But this is, you know, this is something that's really popular with our agency. Um, it's really, um, it's just a great service, I think, and um, you know, for the federal government and and some. It, Sometimes it takes us a long time to get with, you know, um, modern technology. So this is really, uh, it's probably something. So here's the report. Okay. There's your, um, on the first page, it's a PDF. There's your survey area. Um, you know, all sorts of um, information about. And here's the contents. Okay. You do get a pretty for better or for worse, um, pretty thick selection on the map unit description. So it looks like it's, you know, more than 10 pages here. Um, so all the different map unit descriptions, and then you've got all those um, uh, maps and interpretations that we selected. So here are the, um, here's the soil map, okay. There's the legend. There's the map unit legend, okay? It tells you the percentage of the area of interest in the acres. 
We're going metric, but we haven't gotten to hectares yet. Give it time. Um, here's the mapping descriptions. Okay, just like I showed you. But like I said, the, the, the profiles aren't as, you know, they're not, not as much information as you got in those profile descriptions in the old surveys, right? So, you know, there's some things I like the old surveys about. Some things I like about the old survey. It tells you what the, um, actually tells you what the inclusions are, you know, the main components and the inclusions and what percentage, okay? And then um, there's a complex. It has a lot of pages of maps and descriptions. <clears throat> and then we looked at, you know, building site development, the dwellings with basements. We looked at farmland classification. So there's the dwellings with basements. I'm not telling you something you don't know, apparently. Uh, there's the farmland classification. And then we should have the um, depth of water table. Okay, and then you can just, I think you might need to download it and then save it as a PDF file, okay? Okay, so it's probably close to 1.30. That's all I have to say. If anybody has any questions, 